I'm yeah, so I'm Max, um, and I work with uh, John Murray and Dale Lee. Um, and so one of the central questions of cognitive neuroscience is to try and understand the strategies that are used um, uh, within the brain. And, uh, and in particular in decision making, we want to understand the strategies used for decision making. And one way that we can do this is to build computational models and then try and compare those models to data. Um, and so we built a class of models called the generalized drift diffusion model, uh, which I'll tell you more about in a second. Um, and this model um, allows us to encompass a ton of different strategies um, and then also do some cool stuff with it. So for instance, um, I'll tell you about how we did some high throughput model screening. Um, so this is all based on uh, one classic model, which is the drift diffusion model. Uh, so this is a uh, um, this is what most people think of when they think of say like perceptual decision making type of models. Um, and this represents the strategy of just integrating all the information you have. So the idea behind this model um, is just that you acquire noisy in, uh, information over time and you integrate that information. And you have two boundaries, one on the top and one on the bottom, representing two different options that you can choose. Um, your drift rate tells you the average direction of motion. Uh, your starting point tells you, I mean, where you start. And then this non-decision time is uh, time that's not related to the decision that's added on to the end. Um, and once you hit either the top boundary or the lower boundary, that's considered a decision made. And this is a really convenient model because it gives us not only whether we have a correct answer or an incorrect answer, but it also gives us the timing. And so we can get, we can simulate a response time distribution. Um, but again, this is just one strategy. This is the strategy of integrating all the information you have. Um, and what we're more interested in is testing a bunch of different strategies. And so in order to do that, we develop this generalized drift diffusion model. And the concept behind this is we take all of these parameters that I discussed before, like the starting point, the drift rate, the non-decision time, we take all of those parameters and we turn them into functions, uh, either functions or distributions, functions that output distributions. Um, and as a result of that, this flexibility allows us to simulate a ton of different strategies um, that even go in non-integration. So for instance, uh, we can take uh, these boundaries and make them change over time like make them collapse over time so that you get less choosy over time. Uh, we can also have the drift rate change over time. Um, in addition to changing over time, we can also make the drift rate change over space, um, which allows us to do things like leaky integration. So if you're here, it tries to pull it back to the center. Or of course, we can have it leaked somewhere else. So it can try and pull you like right here or something or right here. Um, we can also do things like instead of have a single starting point, we can have a distribution um, uh, start anywhere selected from probability distribution or also a probability distribution uh, representing non-decision time. These can be any distribution you want as well. Um, I'd like to emphasize as well that um, while these can be any function you want that depend on time or space, they can also depend on different parts of the task. So like, let's say you have a task uh, where you want to um, say balance off speed and accuracy. So you have a speed condition and an accuracy condition. You can share the parameters across both of those conditions for most of uh, for all of your trials, even when you have the same participant doing different things, uh, doing the two different conditions. You can share many of the parameters, but then fit other parameters separately. Um, so this allows you to uh, pool data. Or alternatively, uh, if you want your drift rate, so let's say you have some stimulus strength and you want your drift rate to depend on that nonlinearly, you can choose any nonlinearity you want because you can just define arbitrary functions for any of these uh, parameters that depend, on, um, that depend on your drift rate, or sorry, that depend on your task conditions or on um, your time or your position. Um, but in addition to allowing us to test different strategies, this is also really cool because it allows us to test different experimental designs. So the classic drift diffusion model just assumes that your evidence is constant over time. But what we can do here is actually say, okay, let's make our evidence change over time. So it can vary smoothly up and down. Uh, we can have individual spikes. We can have something like a pulse paradigm. Uh, so there are just a ton of possibilities. And this allows us to probe decision-making in, um, in sort of different environments than we normally would with the drift diffusion model that can help us separate out these strategies. Um, I'll mention too that all of these simulations and stuff, um, you can do all of these and fit to data with our open source package, uh, PyDDM. Uh, which I'll give links to in a second. Um, so to first kind of validate our model, uh, we wanted to look at this Reitman and Shadlin data set from their paper, from their 2002 paper. 
Um, the basis of this is the random dot motion task that they gave to monkeys. Um, and what you do is you look at this uh, field that has dots moving to the left and to the right. But there's a higher percentage of dots moving in one direction versus the other. And so your job is to distinguish uh, whether it's to the left or to the right. Um, and once the monkey makes a choice, it's a cod's either to the right or to the left to indicate its choice. Um, and so this uh, sort of like drift diffusion model, we have a reaction time from this. Um, and so we can fit the uh, reaction time distribution. Uh, so first, we tried fitting it with uh, just a normal drift diffusion model. Um, and this is using two popular software packages, one HDDM and the other is EasyDDM um, at three different coherence levels. Um, and this is the correct responses on the top and error responses on the bottom. And you can see that, I mean, it kind of fits the distribution. It kind of doesn't. Um, it's OK. We can fit this with our package, too. Our package can also fit normal drift diffusion models. We're using three parameters only in our, we can fit ours with three parameters in our package. But uh, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, not a great fit. Uh, but when we do a generalized drift diffusion model, we can potentially include different um, different decision making strategies. So here we included uh, just for uh, an example, we included uh, collapsing bounds, so bounds that get smaller over time. We included leaky integration, um, and we also included a nonlinear dependence on coherence. Um, and when we do that with six parameters, we can get almost a perfect fit to the response time distribution. Um, and so that's fewer parameters in there. Um, but also, uh, this allows us to actually explore these mechanisms. So something in these mechanisms is going on. Uh, in, in this, we didn't try and pare it down anymore. But if you do try to, uh, you can get down to only using uh, one or two mechanisms and still get an almost perfect fit like this. So it's possible that uh, by generalizing the drift diffusion model uh, and expanding it to allow these different strategies to be tested, that we can figure out what strategies are going on. Uh, so this data set's been studied a lot. Let's look at a data set where we don't know what's going on. Uh, so this was uh, this data set was collected by Hyo Jung Seo when she was a postdoc in Dale Lee's lab. Uh, and the concept behind this is uh, similar. So instead of random dots moving to the left or right, we have this patch of two different colors, blue and green. And the job of the monkey is to determine, do you have more blue pixels or green pixels here? These pixels are always rearranging where they are. Uh, so you can't just count the number of pixels to make your choice. Um, but this task has two manipulations in it, which make it really interesting and also make it hard to fit with a normal drift diffusion model. So the first one is a reward bias. So if you choose the side with this uh, small, the small square or the thin square, then you get a small reward. And if you choose the one with the thick one, you get a large reward. But of course, only if you get the trial right. So if you don't know and you're just going to guess, maybe you would go to the large reward. That's one strategy. But there are other strategies you could use. Uh, secondly, we looked at, uh, we added this portion called the pre-sample. Um, so I'll refer to the ratio of blue to green pixels as a color coherence. Um, and so the color coherence here is some, I don't know, some value. But uh, here we have a flat uh, zero color coherence. So this is equal number of blue and green pixels for a period of time uh, between zero and 800 milliseconds. So when the stimulus comes on, it might not even be informative. We might have to wait a little while for the stimulus to be informative. So this introduces two interesting dimensions, uh, a time dimension and then a reward dimension into this task. And it's not clear what strategies might be used. Uh, so here's a quick example of this, uh, of this task. Um, and uh, I'll switch to optimize there. Um, so here uh, you can see, so this is an easy trial. Um, and you can see it changes from pre-sample to sample. It's very obvious when it switches. Um, but here's a less obvious one um, with a lower coherence. And so that one's a little bit harder to tell. Um, so we wanted to know what type of mechanism might be underlying uh, the strategy that the monkeys are using. Uh, so we tested a couple of things. So first, we tested an urgency signal based on a gain function. Um, and so an urgency signal is just you're more likely to respond as time goes on. Uh, you don't want to wait forever. Uh, and we implement this one by saying, OK, let's scale the evidence. So as you go through time, you count your evidence more. Uh, you weight your evidence more over time. And you can do that linearly. You can also do this with a, a sort of like a nonlinearity like that um, step. We can also do this with collapsing bounds. So we can change the bounds. Instead of the bounds being flat the whole time, uh, we can make them collapse also either right away or after a delay. Or we cannot have either of these. So these are all potential strategies that the monkey could be using. Uh, we also have a bunch of possible reward strategies. So you can shift your starting point up. 
That's maybe one strategy. Another strategy might be to gradually shift your starting point up over time. Um, another might be to, uh, when you integrate, if you hit the bound on one side, uh, that's the side of the low reward, you might want to, with some probability, just flip to the high reward to keep trying just, just in case. Um, and then we can also have lapses uh, that are asymmetric across the reward. So you're more likely to have a lapse trial in the direction of a high reward than to the low reward. Um, and so we did a high throughput screen on all of these testing uh, uh, one of each of these mechanisms, uh, two of each of these mechanisms, um, in addition to with and without leaky integration to see what happens. Um, and here we're looking at held out log likelihood. Uh, results are basically the same thing for BIC. Um, on the left, you have the different urgency signals. And on the top, you have the different reward mechanisms. Um, and we can see by looking at this, um, and so the lighter colors mean better models. Um, and when we look at this, we can see, oh, look, uh, this mapping error seemed to do pretty well. And also, this, uh, this delayed collapse and this delayed uh, gain urgency signal, these also seem to do pretty well. Um, let's explore this one a little bit more. Um, and so since this is only one reward mechanism, let's take this timing mechanism and look at two each for it, uh, two reward mechanisms each. And so we have our mapping error is still doing very well, but when we combine it with initial bias or to a certain extent time-dependent bias, um, this also starts to look uh, like a very good model. Um, I, I should mention as well that what's really nice about this high throughput approach in comparison to just doing comparisons of individual models is that uh, we can look at classes of models that work well. Uh, so in this instance, we're testing, what, hundreds of models uh, with all these different combinations. Uh, and so we can tell that these urgency signals that have some type of a delay in them tend to do well. Um, and also you need two different reward mechanisms that tend to do well, because like initial bias and time dependent bias don't combine to do any better than one of them alone. Um, and just to confirm that this works, uh, it fits the psychometric function really well. And it also actually fits the response time distributions really well. Uh, so here's the high coherence, uh, middle coherence and low coherence trials. Um, the colors represent different pre-sample durations, and you can't really see underneath, but there's a fuzzy line underneath representing the data, and then this solid line on top uh, representing the model. And this fits, and you can't really see it because the model fits almost perfectly. Uh, so in summary, we can use generalized drift diffusion models to test decision-making strategies, um, and uh, using this type of a modular approach, uh, we can also do thing, really cool things like high-throughput screening. Um, so thanks to both of my advisors, uh, John Murray and Dale Lee. Thanks to Hugh Jung Seo for collecting that data and Norman Lamb for helping with the uh, uh, generalized distribution modeling. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, Wonderful. Thank you is, so much. So much. Yes, yeah, this is our package, by the way. Uh, yeah. So here's the install it there documentation. These are the two papers. And this is the model. This is one of the two graphical user interfaces we have for the package. So you just specify your model and then you can move these sliders around to play with your model and see what the response time distribution looks like. So this is the one with Jupiter, but we have another one too. But yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions. Awesome. So we have a question from Megan Peters and she's asking about what is the effect of noticing the, the change. So you have you know, no change and then it changes. So you notice that change. So would that affect um, any kind of the, the, the decision, especially she's asking, would may that uh, interact with the confirmation biases that is found in the literature? Um, yes. So it's actually pretty cool what you get, um, and we have a uh, we have a paper coming out on this pretty soon. Um, but what you get is you get um, uh, if you if you zoom in to the response time distribution, you get a dip in the response time distribution uh, right when the evidence changes. And you also get a similar dip in neural activity. So I don't know if you're familiar with uh, sort of what you see a uh, stimulus onset in uh, certain brain regions, but like in uh, regions like LIP and FEF, you get this dip in neural activity when the stimulus comes on. You also get it when the stimulus changes, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and so we have a paper coming out soon, which analyzes that. All right, great. So one question that got avoided quite a bit and that's going to be the last one. Um, from Aaron Wong, this offers the ability to fit a large number of models. How do you know that you're not overfitting your data? Yes, that's a great point. So what we did here um, to make sure of that is uh, whenever we did the fitting, 
through all of through this entire project up until the point when we wrote this paper, we only looked at half the data. We didn't even touch the other half of the data. And only once we had written the paper, once we had made all the figures, uh, only then did we uncover the other data and test the model on that other data set. Um, and so this is kind of like the strongest form of uh, some type of cross validation that you can do. Um, and so because of that, uh, uh, we're pretty confident that we're not. And the results were exactly the same in both. Not exactly the same, but um, the important results were exactly the same. And there was a, it was very, very close in both cases. Um, so qualitatively, it was the same. So we were very careful about that. Thanks, Max. Um, so there's a few more questions. Feel free to just respond to them.